me, your host, Sean Lynn, in the pub for a dram with friends where we talk about faith, family, food, and fun. Pull up a chair and I'll pour you a drink. Episode 3. We welcome my good friend, Father Fred Monk, as he talks to us about how a loony can make a mission happen. Sit back as I pour us a ground. Welcome to another episode of A Dram with Friends. We are blessed to have Father Fred Monk join us who recently received the Governor General's Award here in Canada. So welcome, Father Fred. Thank you, Sean. So Father Fred, uh, I I did a little research just for the, to know what what I should be pouring. And it says monk is like Anglo-Scottish heritage. So I thought I'd pull out some scotch and (laughs) a little beanstalk and, a dram is a very small amount. I'm still learning how to pour that that little. It's only an eighth of an ounce, so uh, I, I I never quite get that little in my glass. But I'm practicing. So, see, and I thought a dram was a beer. <laughs> I think that's a pint, isn't it? Oh, could be, could be. There you go. Well, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. And tell us a bit about who Father Fred Monk is, please. Oh my. Well, I was born in Vancouver, raised in Calgary, family of six. I have five siblings. I am the second youngest of the five. So uh, several are 80 or more. We're all pretty healthy. My mother lived to 98. My father died when I was a teenager, young teenager, died very suddenly of cancer, uh, a fast moving cancer. So we, um, we were not a well-to-do family by any stretch. Mind you, in those days, very few people were. And most of the people we knew, we were connected either through school or church. And uh, most of them were in basically the same boat. So, so we you learned grew up to, here in Calgary, eh? I grew up in Calgary, yeah. Okay. Went to through a school there. Uh, <laughs> Uh, old Holy Angel School, that's probably all, that's, that's closed now. I'm and not then, familiar uh, with that one. And eventually to um, uh, St. Mary's Boys, before it was St. Mary's Co-Ed. Okay. Uh, way back when. Um, I, uh, in the early years, I led the music at the cathedral for many years. And then was music director at St. Anthony's and at St. Mark's. Oh, wow. Prior to entering the seminary. Now, prior to that, I, um, when I finished uh, high school, I worked, for, uh, or I worked for a couple of years, and then I, as a mature student, I went back to school and uh, got a, a diploma in social work, worked for many years as a probation and parole officer and family court worker. Oh, wow. So I was a late vocation. I wasn't ordained until I was 40. And, and it, it may surprise you, it wasn't a very long time, but uh, many, many years ago, I, have to, I can't even think back when, but at one point, I was the chaplain of the Calgary City Police for about six weeks, and then I got moved <laughs> uh, to oh, my first parish. That's so, unfortunate. Um, so you, you might have known my dad and my, my stepmom, because she was a social worker, and my dad was a detective on the, on the police service back, uh, I'm guessing, around the time that you were you're talking about. Because if you didn't become a priest till you were 40, that must have only been a couple years ago, right? <laughs> um, don't I wish. <laughs> <laughs> so now you The worst part, Sean, is somebody asked me today, how long have you been retired? And I couldn't remember. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, that means you're enjoying retirement. I am. Uh, I am. That's good. That's good. So tell us about uh, how you ended up well, first you got the Governor General's Award this summer, but that was a, as a result of the work you did with Mission Mexico here in the Diocese of Calgary. So how did that all come to be? Well, going back to high school days, 
uh, Father Larry Moran was one of my teachers. And he was a, uh, a physics teacher, and he was kind of this wild, uh, crazy professor type. And uh, we called him Zeke behind his back, um, affectionately. And uh, one summer he decided that he'd read about people in the southern part of Mexico and how they've been persecuted for years and mistreated by the military and uh, the authorities, the government. And he decided to go to Mexico. And so he went to southern Mexico to the area where our projects are, uh, which is far south. Of just the, the main center there is Tlalapa. It's about eight hours south of Mexico City, roughly. I, uh, I could be off an hour or two there. But, um, and um, he would come back and tell us stories. And he, he would tell us the stories of what he experienced there. And he said, now, don't just take my word for it. One day you go to Mexico. Well, I never thought that would happen. Um, and so years later, after I, I, I worked, as I say, as a social worker for many years, and, and then the last few years, I was uh, the uh, director of the United Way campaign, United Way of Calgary, um, and met with the bishop. Next thing I knew, I was in the seminary, and here we are years later. It's the year 2000. So that was in 1987, by the way. And okay. so that I was ordained. And uh, year 2000, I'm in Cochrane. We're trying to raise uh, roughly $10 million to build a new church. And uh, somehow I got this idea that if we're going to build a church, we should actually be helping the poor. So I suggested to the, the parish that for a, a Jubilee Year 2000 project, rather than buy a, a bell or another window or whatever, let's do something for the poor and said, you know, there was this priest when I was in high school, told the story, said, I don't know whatever became of him, but I'll try to find out. And I was having lunch with uh, some parishioners a few days later and happened to mention this. And they said, Father Moran? I said, yeah. He said, he taught me, the fellow says. He said, we're going down to see him next week. And so what had happened was when he finally retired from teaching school uh, as a priest, he went down to Mexico, was working full-time among the poor, uh, among the poorest of the poor. And at this point, he would have been in his late 70s, I believe. Um, so they came back and said, I said, tell Father Moran, tell him um, uh, I'll raise, I'll raise $10,000. Just came off the top of my head. And so they came back and said, well, there's a group of sisters there that run an orphanage. And there's a, a need for the, the building is falling apart and they need a new building. And Father Moran said that would be the best use of that. And, you know, $10,000, we'd build this orphanage. Well, Father Moran was never one for all the details up front. And so as time went on, we learned that we needed an architect and we needed an engineer and we needed to, you know, on and on. We needed to buy land and so on. So this little project was going to cost a little more. So. When I approached the finance council and the parish council to tell them that I had uh, promised that I would raise $10,000 uh, after they almost tarred and feathered me uh, because they said, we're, we're trying to raise $10 million here. I said, look, if we don't help the poor, there's no sense building the church. Yep. Uh, that, that's, that's, that's who we should be. And if we're not prepared to do that, then why build a church? So they reluctantly agreed and then I found out that the building was actually going to cost $100,000. So I thought, I'm dead. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. And uh, so that night, I tossed and turned for a while, and I had this dream. And in the dream, I did the math. And I figured that if every parishioner in the parish would give just a loony a week for a year, we'd have $100,000. And so that's how I approached it. Um, and uh, I became known as the loony priest as a result of this over time. And so that's how it started. And, and the reason for this was, was twofold. One was to convince the parish council that we would go ahead with this. And uh, secondly, that anyone could be a part of this. If you can only afford a loony, you are part of Mission Mexico. But if you have more than that, uh, you're, you're more than welcome to uh, you know, uh, uh, donate that as well. So those who had much gave much, and those who didn't uh, gave a loony or a quarter, or we had kids putting the dimes in every Sunday or quarters every Sunday. Um, and it became a, a, a real 
uh, outpouring of, of love from the community, from the parish. So we started January 1st, uh, 2000, or sorry, uh, January 1st, 2000. And on uh, Christmas Eve that year, I announced that not only had we raised the 100,000, but we'd exceeded it by $10,000. Wow. And that extra $10,000 we would give to the sisters who were running the orphanage. The building was already under construction and uh, we wouldn't move on with our building. Well, between Christmas and New Year's, about $48,000 came in. People wow. literally were driving up to the rectory and to the church and saying, we need to continue, we need to do more. This has changed our kids, it's changed our families, it's changed our parish. And so as a result, we went on to the second project, and the third and fourth and so on. And then eventually, um, a couple of other parishes came on with us. I spoke to Bishop Henry at the time, and said, wouldn't it be nice if this were a diocesan project? And he agreed. So he declared uh, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, December the 12th, Mission Mexico Day in the diocese. And we asked every school student and every parishioner of all the parishes to contribute a loony. So from that first loony that we, we raised in, in 2000 to when I retired, we'd raised almost 5, 000, 5 million loonies, excuse me. And we built a we built a high school. We built a medical center. We've, you know, funded all kinds of uh, microeconomic projects. Uh, we put kids through high school, through school, elementary school, high school, and even university. So we have kids who now have gone through the entire system, and uh, you, you know, when we when we think of that, like a, a scholarship for a, a student in in Mexico to go to, to university for a year, is only about $1,000 Canadian. So it's, it's, it's nothing for us, but it's, it's a miracle for them. They believe they're, they're seeing miracles happen. Oh, and I'm so sure it, they are. And, and the, the, I love the part that you talk about inviting everyone to partake, because I, I've worked a lot with young people and just giving them something to do to feel part of something is so much for them. Well, also, Sean, if I ask you for a donation for the Heart Fund, you're going to think I'm asking for big bucks, you know, yeah. or, or you don't want to be embarrassed. You say, oh, gee, you know, I, I really can't right now, or I've got whatever. But if I ask you for a dollar, you'll give me, you'll say, oh, I'll give you five. Um, so, I mean, at least it gives you the option of, of, of uh, you know, being more generous if you want to, or you know, not having to feel that you're obligated to give a lot. Yeah, and and you've done wonders with it, and I want to thank you for for setting that foundation. And just hearing you talk helps reset. You know, rather than looking for the big bucks, just asking for those loonies, I think would help Mission Mexico. It, it's been a rough year for them, I know financially with the COVID sure. and, and some changes on the board and stuff like that. Just, so we're getting our feet back under us and we want to start running again. And, and that's where just keep it simple, a loony and let, let Jesus do the work, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. So. And Jesus, Jesus and Mike. <laughs> he, Jesus and Mike. Mike. Has been a, Mike has been a godsend to us. And you know, interestingly enough, I, he's probably told you the story, but, he came out from Nova Scotia to teach at St. Mary's uh, in Calgary. And um, in his first year of teaching there, Father Moran invited him to come down to Mexico. I believe it was his first year, first or second year. Invited him to come down for a summer. And here we are 41 years later and Mike has not uh, come back yet. Yeah, uh, I, I, uh, I talked to him recently and he, he says he's going to die there. That's his plan. Yeah. That's what yeah. he wants. And uh, yeah. and I said that he'd, he'd have to send back his hand like St. Francis Xavier so we'd have something to venerate in Canada. So, <laughs> <laughs> Well, and I told him recently, I said, if you don't improve your driving, it's going to happen before, you know, <laughs> before long. He'll be gone. But uh, so, the, uh, the roads there are absolutely horrific. I just want to share a story about uh, 
so you and and Father Jerry Dowling were good buddies, and uh, Father Jerry Dowling was uh, our first spiritual advisor for the God Squad way back when we we started, and he passed away, and you were preaching at his funeral, and you came up with the tagline it's better to smoke in this life than the next which is now on all our on our barbecue trailer and our apron <laughs> and stuff. So, uh, i want to thank you for that well you're welcome well that's you know he was a very heavy smoker and we kept saying you gotta quit you gotta quit and he would say you know it's better to smoke in this life than in the next that was yeah that was his uh well we, we it, grew up we grew up together went through school together and we uh we snuck out of class together, and I learned to smoke with him. <laughs> he was a bad influence. Okay. Um, but I managed to quit many years later. But. Oh, good for you. Good for you. And and now you're retired. You're in Medicine Hat, and and life is good down there. You said you're doing some ph photography. Is that your passion? or? Well, it started many years ago, probably almost 20 years ago now. I went for my annual medical. And the doctor said, if we don't find you a hobby soon, you'll be dead within the year. He said, you got a lot of stress in your life and you're going too much, you know, you're working too hard and whatever. Um, and so he said, you got to find a hobby. And my brothers are both golfers and I thought that was a waste of time. So I wasn't <laughs> going to do that. <laughs> and uh, I always wanted to take up photography. So I bought, a, I bought a camera, didn't even know how to turn the thing on. And uh, I, it, I, I booked a, a week off in the summer, in July. Um, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Because when you're holidaying as a priest, it's not always, you know, it, it's not great holidaying alone. Nobody likes to be in a restaurant by themselves. Uh, so I, um, um, I Googled uh, uh, photography class, Rocky Mountains, July, whatever. And I got this hit. And it was a... a um, photography instructor from Oregon that came up to Banff National Park every summer and he would take six students oh, and wow. he and I thought well there's not a chance but he, he emailed back and he said I just had someone cancel this week you're in if you want and that's how it started oh good for you and uh, so I've, I've used the, the camera has been a very important part of my ministry over the years and then let me just briefly explain that when I uh, went into a, a rural parish, and most of my life I was in rural parishes, which I love, because you really get to know people, and, and, and uh, you get to know the, the dogs' names, for heaven's sakes. And um, I, there was a young, uh, a, cu a couple there I knew, and, and their young son and his wife were building a new uh, concert. And uh, so we were chatting after Mass, they said, well, you know, the, the, um, the crane is coming this week to lift in the rafters. And I said, gee, that would be fun to photograph. Would you mind if I came? Oh, no, we'd love it. So I went back or by, and I'm taking some photographs of the, all this work going on, the construction. And the mother of this young man was sitting there, and she said, you have no idea how much we appreciate this. She said, most people don't care what small people do. And when she said that, I thought, small people, that's that. How tragic that people feel that way. So I, I, I said, we're going, I'm going to use this camera to celebrate these communities. And uh, my first, the first book I published, probably 30 some odd books now, photography and uh, self-published. And my, my very first book was a book of uh, photographs of County 40 Mile, which is the southern part of the province around Bow Island and Messon Hat and so on. And... Uh, so we we celebrated their lives. Oh, right on. Yes, I as a young man I drilled many wells down in southern Alberta, so I spent a lot of time in and yeah. around uh, there. So it that's that's amazing cuz it it's it's interesting how many people have these hidden lives much like St. Joseph, right? St. Joseph even Took him 1,800 years to be even recognized as patron of the church, <laughs> but uh, we have so many beautiful people, and and one of the things we we want to do is is that evangelization and get out and meet people and let them know that 
that they are important, that God loves them and has a plan for them. Absolutely. And you know, the interesting thing, Sean, when I left, when I retired and left Bow Island, um, there were several hundred people came to a farewell. But the greatest honor for me was that more than half of them were not Catholic. And these were people who got to know me because they weren't afraid of the camera. And they'd see me out photographing, they'd come and talk to me, or they'd ask me to take a photograph. Uh, and that's how I built relationships with a lot of people in the community. Uh, the camera became a very important tool in the ministry. So well, you never know. You know, it exactly. can be the simplest, simplest thing that we have that opens the door. We don't have to be preaching on the street corner. Uh, we just have to be available to people. And, well, and we've, the last number of years, we've done it on our motorcycles. Uh, I, I got Father Marius uh, to join us. And <laughs> he, you talked about quiet, lonely holidays. He commented on that, how much he appreciates the fellowship of riding with us. Uh, mm -hmm. Just going and having a dinner together and debriefing and, and maybe having a wee dram at the end of the night. And, and, uh, and that's where I realized that as, especially as men, we need to support our priests and, and give them a, a safe environment for them to unwind that you talked about stress and just creating safe environments for priests to, to feel like they can unwind and, 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 and let, just talk through. I did, uh, I did peer support with the Calgary Police Service for 19 years. And it's one of the more effective tools of helping people deal with stress is just having somebody to talk through issues that they're going through. And I'm, I'm sure you guys have your share of issues and uh, uh, just being aware and giving a safe place for to decompress and, and, and work through your stresses, right? So... Yeah, and I remember, you know, years ago, a friend of mine, he was a police officer, we were chatting, and I said, you know, only a priest really understands a priest. And he said, it's true of cops, too. Only a police officer understands a police officer. Because we deal with a lot of things we can't share with others. We deal with a lot of confidential matters. We deal with a lot of stressful situations. And in many, in many ways, the life of a priest and a police officer are very similar. Uh, that you've got to carry a lot of stuff. And if you're not, if you don't find uh, at least some people that you can you know, be honest with and open up, uh, you, can, you can become, well, you know, the, the, the situations that many, many priests and many uh, police officers find themselves in over the yeah. years. And, and that's where we're, we're trying to reach out to as many men as possible. And that's why we're doing this podcast. So, I'm, I'm instituting a new uh, part of the program with you. So what would you tell your 18 year old self now with the wisdom that you have? Because unfortunately, I think we need to, to, to help young men, especially in today's world, figure out what a man is. And we really don't have that in, uh, in today's culture for especially the young men. So what would you tell yourself, your 18-year-old self? 18-year-old self. You know, I think one of the first things I would say is trust your gut. Um, sometimes we feel, oh, if I do that, I'm gonna, it'll be, I'll be embarrassed. People will think I'm nuts. People will, you know, nobody will get behind it. Uh, Mission Mexico is a good example. Uh, come up with something like that. You've got initially... You've got resistance to it but for obvious reason, you know, for good reason. Uh, but you stick to your guns and say, you know what, we got to do. We're called to be more than just, uh, you know, passing by in this life. We're called to leave our mark. We're car called to live the gospel and to to uh, not not to um, what's the I, you know I often say we we're, we're not giving people in Mexico a handout. We're giving them a hand up. Um, you know, it, it's, it's as we would with anyone in our neighborhood or anyone in our family who is going through a rough time. Uh, but I, I would say don't be afraid to, to reach out to others. 
don't be afraid to share what you're going through either. You know, as, as men, I think it's all, oh, well, you know, I'm fine, I'm fine. Um, most men are not. Um, uh, you know, we've got lots of, we, we need people that we can be honest with. And we need people who will be honest with us. Um, you know, well, I, and, I, and you, you had shared, like, we're a little delayed on, on the recording because you were dealing with probably some men that didn't deal with their issues. And and unfortunately we've got to reach out and and be more available to the men in our community and that's what we're trying to do we're we're launching a platform through the catholic men's leadership alliance called heroicmen.com and it's it's just tools for for guys to to put in their tool belt and and so i didn't catch the first name uh, sean so it's called heroicmen.com oh, heroic. okay. and uh, it's, so we're, we're hoping, and that's where the plan is for this to, to be featured on is, is one of their tools is this podcast, a dram with friends where we talk about faith, family, food, and fun. So, yeah. so I think we've covered a few of those. I don't know if you have a recipe that you want to share or, <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, well, as Father Burke Hoskin, I, I, I followed Father Burke Hoskin at Cochrane, and the CWL used to put together a cookbook all the time. And so they asked him to put something in. And so he, he put in a recipe on how to cook frozen peas. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me you got a little more culinary. I have uh, a little more than that. <laughs> okay, Not <good>. a lot. <laughs> okay. Uh, I want to thank you for taking the time to to join us tonight and uh i pray actually i i'm still working on my closing here and as i explained to you i was rushed my wife wanted to go look at some uh a dishwasher and a fridge so happy wife happy life and that's and why you better, little, you, and you better make sure you look at that tonight <laughs> yeah so we we did that that's why we were a little late getting started here but uh the the word whiskey actually comes from uh the gaelic word uh ishkabaha which means water of life and we want to and i my bible is oh it's over here that's not it there it is it's right here and i was thinking about that and led me to almost one of the last paragraphs in the in the bible where it talks about and here in revelations it says just a second it's right at the back here one of the last verses of the bible it says come and let him who is thirsty let him who desires take the water of life without price so come that is the true water that we are trying to lead men to i also just remind you sean that uh, without monks uh, and i'm not speaking of my family particularly but without the monks we probably would never have experienced beer i and they make <laughs> some of the best beers even to this day my understanding is one of the top beers is in Belgium where you have to go to a local bar to get permission to go get a six pack from the monastery yeah. for that one. So, yeah. so anyway, it's been a delight, Sean. I, I thank, but I also want to thank you for your work and the work that you've done with men, you know, through the God squad over the years um, and the work that you continue to do and for the work you're doing now with mission Mexico being on the board. Um, I, I, I'm, it's like someone said, you know, it's like, how do you feel? You're, you're, you've, you've given your baby away. And I said, you know what? It's like any parent. You raise a child to a certain level and then you hope that the child can go off on its own. And, and that's how I feel about Mission Mexico. So don't screw up, Sean. Cause I'll <laughs> well, I will do my best. And, uh, and I think that's what God, I'll let God do the rest. And, uh, the sure. old adage, Jesus, I trust in you. Uh, and and I always have St. Joseph by my side. So he, he's pretty good at providing for things. So, 
I'm going to leave it in his hands as well. So, sure. cheers and cheers. Have a good, have a good evening. Sean. Yeah, keep in touch. I will. I hope you've enjoyed this episode of A Dram with Friends. If you have any questions or suggestions, please go to a dram at godsquad.ca or make a donation to godsquad.ca if you would like to support our ministry.